lectures about why we do statistics, how we do statistics. Um, now let's talk about practical applications of statistics, essentially deep learning. Um, and so deep learning is quite the buzzword. Right? You, you, you hear deep learning everywhere. And if, for example, you drive around San Francisco, you see it even on billboards. You know, deep learning for this, deep learning for that. Deep learning for improving toilet flushing or something. Everybody wants to do deep learning, right? So what is actually deep learning? What does it mean? I really want you guys to come away from this talk understanding really what it is, right? Uh, most of the society thinks it means preparing for our AI overlords, right? Um, most of computer scientists think you're just cashing in. Most math mathematicians think you're just monkeying around with ideas they've been playing around with for a long time, right? But in particle physics, essentially, this is it, right? We just surf on the backs of a huge industry that's been developing these tools already to solve other problems that are much less interesting and important to us. And we just need to use their ideas and, uh, and hit our particular nails. Okay, so why do we have to do deep learning? The reason is that we don't have data like this. Right? It used to be in particle physics, you could look for a particle, you could see one, and there it is. You could show it to people, right? like, hey, look, one event, I found this new particle, let's all agree. Sort of like looking for a unicorn, right? Difficult to find, but once you found it, everybody's pretty sure it's a unicorn. Right? Not, our, not our circumstances these days, right? Because everything we do is indirect. You know, if you want to, for example, look for the Higgs boson, you know, you're fusing two gluons, you make the Higgs boson, you see the B quarks, but you never actually see the Higgs, right? And the Higgs can be hiding among many, many other processes that give you similar stuff in your data. So basically, in the end, we're always doing statistics. And as I described in the last few lectures, essentially what we're doing is a hypothesis test. We're asking nature, which of these two models do you prefer? Standard model or standard model plus X, right? And in the case of a single uh, dimensional analysis, we talked about how this is pretty straightforward. You have one hypothesis, another hypothesis, you could put a threshold here and you could make your decision. No need for deep learning in that circumstance. As soon as you go to two dimensions, right? For a signal and background distribution, there's lots of different ways you could make this choice. So it already becomes quite complicated. But Nia and Pearson tell us, we know how to do this, right? It's not an issue. As long as you can evaluate this likelihood ratio, probability of x given your hypothesis, then you can get the optimal decision value, right? If this is the distribution of the likelihood ratio, you put some threshold here, that maps to some high dimensional space and says, this is the space where your signal is more likely to live relative to your background, and this is exactly the shape of the decision value you should use for the optimal power of your analysis. Awesome, right? This is fairly straightforward if you can calculate this, or in general, if you have a tool that can do this calculation at all, right? the probability of seeing your data given theory. You need two of these to form your likelihood ratio. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, right? If, for example, you have a very effective model, talked about looking for a resonance search. You have a background here, you have a spectrum over it. In this case, your um, likelihood ratio is pretty straightforward to calculate. You get your data, your model is literally just the prediction of the density inside a bin where your data is, right? And so you know how to calculate this likelihood ratio because your statistical model here, the unique field likelihood ratio, is pretty easy to calculate. In general, though, we don't have this for particle physics because there's so many complicated pieces here, right? So let's think for a moment, what would this, what would this look like? So I try to write it out for you. Um, you know, we need to write the probability of seeing data given some final state particles, the probability of producing those final state particles given showered particles, the probability of seeing those shower particles given hard scatter products, and the probability of producing hard scatter products given some theory. And because these bits here, um, the showered particles, um, the hard scatter products, etc., etc., are intermediate, they're unobserved, we need to sum over all possible values, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. Now this part here, this part is actually pretty well understood, right? We have uh, automatic calculators that exist for that, so that's done, right? The rest of it, while we have a pretty solid understanding of this microphysics, we don't have an analytic description of the high-level physics. And this is really the problem. So what we can do is we draw events from this, and then we push them through our simulators to add random showers, add hazardization, simulate detectors, right? Which means that we're in this funny statistical situation where we can get arbitrarily large samples of events, but we don't know what the actual the, the underlying distribution for 
from which those events are drawn. Right? We have a procedure for generating as many examples as we like, but we don't know what it is. And so we talked about if you have a pile of examples, how can you recreate the original function? Right? Well, you can just do a histogram and say, well, use a bin, and that works pretty well. And in some cases, that's enough. You know, if you're doing a single dimensional analysis, like M gamma gamma, you're looking for the Higgs boson, that's really all you need. You need to do enough simulation in order to fill a histogram <coughs> in one dimension and describe this shape so you can evaluate what these like these uh, probabilities are, these likelihoods, and calculate the likelihood ratio, right? But how much simulation do you need? If you say 100 events per single dimension, then in a n-dimensional distribution, right, it, a naive histogram approach, then it goes like 100 to the n. And remember, an atlas, our data is a 100 million dimensional vector, which means that this problem is like totally intractable. Okay? So where does machine learning come in? This is the role of machine learning. It is to solve this problem by doing this dimensional reduction for us. Okay? Imagine some high dimensional space, I'm only drawing two for you here because we have a two dimensional screen, where your signal is embedded among the standard model. Essentially, we want to ask the machine learning to say, could you perhaps boil all this information down for me into a one-dimensional distribution? Because I can handle using simulation to describe the shape of a one-dimensional distribution. I can do that. Right? If, if we can somehow boil it down to one dimension, then we can do this calculation using our standard tools. Right? So I believe in trying to formulate a problem clearly. And when the AI overloads <coughs> arrive, I think we should be prepared ask them exactly what we want. And this is exactly what we want machine learning to do. You say, find me some function okay, um, from a high dimensional space where my data lives down to one dimensional space. I don't really care anything about that function except I want it to have exactly the same power as the, the optimal one, which is the likelihood ratio. If you can find for me the likelihood ratio, great. I don't know how to calculate it. I don't know if it's tractable. If you could deduce that, that'd be fine. But I want any function that has the same hypothesis that we have. This is kind of almost a philosophical question. How do you control for the possibility that neither has the hypothesis of right capacity? So for not just there is non-standard model stuff, but it's not standard model plus X, let's say standard model plus Y, and so standard model plus Y might look quite different from either. And how, how would that influence your um, alpha? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's a bit aside from what we're talking about here. We have to talk about it over lunch sometime. But essentially, can what we're doing here is we set up a hypothesis test for one to the other. Um, but you can reject both hypotheses if you to describe the data. Both of them are really small. Can you something that is asked of? This function, we don't know what this function is. We know it exists, and we know that it uh, accomplishes this. This is a one-dimensional function, right? X here is multidimensional, but this is a scalar. So it definitely is possible. Neyman Pearson tells us it exists if you only could know it. Right? <coughs> okay, so this is the task of machine learning. Now, we, we want to be more general. We don't need to find, find this one. We can find something which is one-to-one -one with this, or you know, equivalently solves the problem, which we talked about yesterday. It might not be the unique solution. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this problem is too hard to solve, right? It's just too big because the space of possible functions to look at is infinite, right? The space of possible ideas you can have is infinite. So a standard approach is to say, well, let's try to solve a narrower related problem, right? Let's approximate, let's come close to this problem. Let's assume that f of x is an element of some set of functions described by structure and properties, right? Instead of having this vast ocean of possible ideas, we'll build a structure into this space, and we'll explore that structure. We'll hope that our solution to the general problem lives in this subspace, right? And we have no reason to think that it does, but we can't solve the more general one, so we'll try to solve this one and hope that the solution lives in there. The structure of what? The structure of the space of all possible functions. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and we do this a lot, right? We say, let's constrain our possible ideas to some subset because that helps us explore. You know? uh, often we use Taylor expansion to do this. We say uh, we don't need to think about all possible functions. We just think about functions described by a few terms of an expansion. Or you know, in particle physics, 
you are highly constrained by the possible, uh, in thinking of new theories of physics, by a few rules that we have for how to write down Lagrangians, which are Lorentz invariants, and engage invariants, et cetera, et cetera, right? That constrains your possible ideas. It's very helpful in order to structure your, your thoughts. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, we say, what if we could build f of x, right, which sometimes in these notes uh, I'll call y of x, I apologize, out of a pile of mini functions, okay, and I'm gonna maybe convolute them together as well. So x is our input data, right, it's just a vector of data, it's arbitrarily dimensional. <coughs> so we take that data, we give each element of that data a weight, right, so a different weight for every element. Um, we, then we sum over it, we potentially add a constant, and then we pass that through some nonlinear activation function. Okay, so we uh, you know, rotated or distorted this and then passed it through some activation function. Okay, so these now, these w's are parameters um, of this function here, of uh, y, right? We've added these parameters. And what is this activation function? Well, you can make a few choices. You could have it um, have this sort of very sharp turn on or a smoother turn on, but some sort of turn on where you know, below some threshold it's low, and then it's above some threshold it's high. Okay? And you can represent this graphically. Say these are all your inputs, right? And uh, here you have a weight assorted city to this line, and all these guys come together as inputs to this here, and inside here you have the activation function. So you're weighting all of these guys as they come inside, you sum over it, and you pass it through the activation function in that node. Um, I haven't given you any justification to say that this will work, right? I just said, let's try, right? I, I, there's no proof that this will work, okay? Let's just see what, what it can do. And then what we can do is we can say, um, how good is a particular function, right? Say I choose some function, I have a set of weights, etc. cetera, how, how well does it do? Well, if I know what the right answer is for my problem, right? I say, for example, uh, this input is signal, this input is background. If I know what the truth is, then I can define how far the answer is from the truth. Right? I know what the perfect performance is, so I can say I can compare the output to the truth. Right? And I just sum over all of a bunch of examples that I have, generated examples, and I say how far are they from the truth, and I do error squared. Okay? So what do we have now? Well, we've defined a space. We say we hope our function lives somewhere in this space, where the space is defined by the possible way. Every set of weights you choose gives you a different function. Right? And for any point in that space, we have that function, and we can evaluate the quality of that function. So we've defined this function, this space of functions, and for every point in that space, we have a number which tells us how good is this one. So now the task is find the maximal point in that space. Right? So we've already simplified this problem uh, by making a whole bunch of unjustified assumptions. Right? Now we're faced with another generally unsolvable problem, right? Which is maximize a function over a space where you have no information about the behavior of the function. The function could be totally flat and then have a delta function in the middle. Right? You have no clues that you're going to get you're near the solution unless you're right on top of it. It could be convex and be like very smooth and easy to solve. It could be anything, right? In general, this is a, an unsolved problem, but we have to search this space. Okay, so we're going to do something silly. We're just going to use gradient descent. We're going to say, we'll make an initial guess, right? We just choose some random weights, okay? So we'll do this iteratively. Step tau, step tau plus one. So we make some initial guess at tau equals zero, just random choices. And then we, the, the choices we make the next time, tau plus one, are the initial ones plus an update based on um, this, this gradient. Right, we say, which direction should we move in order to improve our score? So, you know, you choose a random point in this, in this landscape, and then you look and you try to climb uphill. And eta tells you, essentially, how far to move in that direction before we evaluate it. Right? Eta is very, very small. You say, well, this way is uphill, I'm going to take a tiny step, and then we evaluate it. Eta is large, and you say, I'm going to take a huge step in the direction of uphill. Right? <coughs> So this is now a, a learning, it's called the learning rate. And this has some nice properties, right? If we define our whole function, um, so we have this guy here, this is the sum, of the, we have their input, we weight them, we sum over it, we pass it to our activation function, right? Um, 
and the output can be written as h of u, right? Then we can just take the derivative of this, and we can and we can uh, take the derivative, and then we get the derivative. So sorry, we can evaluate this error in a nice way, right? By taking the derivative with respect to the weights. Right? This is the quantity we need here. Is this derivative? We need to be able to take this derivative, which means we need to know the derivative of the activation function. Not a big deal. Okay, and <clears throat> it turns out that this works pretty well. Uh, this kind of strategy is a model for what happens inside your brain. These are neural <coughs> these are nodes inside your neural network, and it works pretty well. Um, but a complex network, if you really train it, you say, um, learn that these guys are good and these guys are bad, then it might learn, for example, to, to construct these kind of shapes around the particular details of the sample you trained it on. Then you have an independent sample drawn from the same distributions but have with unique statistical fluctuations, you take this same boundary, it might not perform very well. So what you do is you have a sample on which you're learning and another sample on which you're testing. You only believe the performance on this independent one because you're not interested in learning the statistical fluctuations of one particular sample you generated on a Tuesday. You want this thing to perform well in general. So you keep doing this updating and you evaluate the error rate on your training sample, which by construction will continue to decrease or plateau because that's, that's what you're doing is you're looking for ways to decrease the error. And you also monitor the performance on this test sample, which is independent, right? It's not, it's not, it's, uh, you're not using the information in the test sample to perform the update, so it continues to be independent. And you see that the error rate drops, but then at some point it stops dropping. So you know that between here and here, all it's learning is statistical fluctuations in the training sample. It's not learning anything that's useful or generalizable or can be used to actually evaluate on new data. So this means that you've overtrained, right? So the um, the true values, uh, those are the optimal parameters W. Are these true these true values here? No, just in the in the formula oh. before you you know T sub A, I think. When you yeah. Yes, yeah, T sub A. Yeah. So what what are these? What the true values of what? Uh, so this is, for example, labels saying this is signal and this is background. So, for example, one and zero, or whatever choices you have. Okay. Uh, th this axis is time or training epoch. So, tau in this case. Right? You keep updating your search through this function space as the error rate decreases. So this is time or, or step in your learning. At every step, do you have to keep the same test sample and the same training sample, or do you change? Training? You have to keep the training the test sample independent. You never use information from the test sample in the training. You could modify the training sample, but you have to keep this independent in order to measure that. So what's going to happen if you overtrain? What happens if you overtrain is that you learn statistical fluctuations in the training sample. Not, not helpful. For example, the optimal performance is draw a tiny decision boundary around every single dot. Right? That's useless. Right? Or it's like saying, or we might say, okay, I'll just list all of these guys and I'll just do a check. Is that point one of these? If so, I'll maybe do a one. Otherwise, no. It's also useless. talk more about this later. Um, how to avoid overtraining is very, very important. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other strategies. And one of them is, is modifying the training center. Can you avoid the time of data problem? How do you do it? It's, it's, it's an
<laughs> okay, so um, why do you get overtraining? Well, sometimes your model has too many parameters, right? Say you have 1,000 data points and 5,000 parameters. Right? And your model is really, really flexible, and it can accommodate the details of, your, of the statistical fluctuations <coughs> in your training sample, right? Or maybe your model has poor parameters, right? They're not well chosen. Or maybe you got stuck in a local minimum in your weight space. Now, you can make much more complicated networks also, right? We just talked about essentially a single layer, but once you take these inputs and weight them in, and pass them through an activation function, you can then just add another layer. And this is a, a graphical way to represent it, which is suggestive of, you know, the neural structure in your brain. Really, it's just still a convolution of convolutions of functions, right? You're just passing this data through. You can take that and pass it through another function. Right? So you can do this as many times as you want, to build up a more complicated um, uh, function. And so the way, you should, the way I think about it is the structure of the network, meaning how many nodes there are and how they are connected, defines the structure of the function space. Then you, that specifies what all the weights are, right? You have every line here is a weight that needs to be determined. So once you choose the structure of the function, that should, sorry, the structure of the network, that determines the structure of the function, and then the parameters need to be figured out. So every network, every structure of every network defines a different functional space over which you need to search for the weights to find the best performance. So you have two choices to make. One, how do I structure my network? Or two, how do I search for the best weights given that network structure? So do you, do you gain anything from this uh, over, you know, just having your activation function initially be, uh, you know, a, a general polynomial in X? Great question. Okay, so this is exactly the topic that people have been thinking about for a long time. Um, <clears throat> people thought for a long time that the best structure here was to use a simple um, close to linear activation function and to have the input layer, one hidden layer, and an output layer. And there was this paper, um, I think it was in the early 90s, that made this claim that said any function can be learned, any function on the inputs can be learned using a single hidden Okay, that's a very powerful statement. And it's helpful because multiple layers are hard. Right? Training multiple layers are difficult. Why? Because when we think about how we are training, we're training by comparing the output um, to the truth. So you have the difference here. And then you're taking the gradient of the weights, right? So that you can figure out how to change this weight, how to change this weight, how to change this weight. And you're pushing that back. Then you need to use that to take the gradient of this one. These gradients approach zero very quickly as you push them back through several layers. So training several layers is very hard. So when people learn, oh, all you need is one layer, that's nice. Also, it means you have fewer choices, right? You don't have to decide how many layers do I put in, how complex is my network. This paper tells me any, any function can be learned by a single hidden layer. Great, okay? There's a caveat in that paper. It doesn't tell you how large this layer has to be. It might be that that layer needs an infinite number of nodes, or 100,000 nodes, right? So it's one of these um, claims that is, in theory, pretty cool, but practically not that easy. And <clears throat> what happens sort of sociologically is that people said, well, if I have n nodes here, I'll just do like, you know, 2n here, and that should be good enough. Right? Without any proof. Right? The proof just said, in my experience, that seems to work. Okay? <clears throat> the problem is, that networks are not very good, these networks are not very good at learning nonlinear functions because the activation function is, is close to linear, right? And so what you've done is you have an activation, so this is your input, you have one linear, one semi-linear transformation here, one more here. The space of all possible functions includes a lot of very nonlinear transformations which cannot be described by this structure. Remember, Choosing the structure defines all the possible functions we can consider. After that, all you have is the freedom to is tweak the weights. It might be that there's no tweaking of the weights that describes the function that you need. And a lot of times, in particle physics especially, we need very nonlinear functions, right? Say you're looking for a particle, and you didn't know that, and all you have is the Cartesian four vectors of your particles, right? And you didn't know that there's a huge resonance in them. So you just throw that at your network and say, figure this out. A network like this can't find the resonance. Right? It can't do an invariant mass calculation. There's a square root in there, there's stuff squared, 
It just does not have the tools necessary to assemble these mini functions into the function that you need. So what people discovered in practice in using neural networks up until about five or ten years ago is that you can't do that. You can't just say, here neural network, here is all the information, I'm going to go to lunch, and when I come back, I want you to tell me exactly how to separate my signal from my background. Okay, and here's an example from an intern internal Atlas paper. Atlas was searching for Higgs to Tau Tau, and <clears throat> um, there were various channels, you know, BBF, tau, leptonic, hadronic, whatever. And this is the variables they were considering. And a dot meant we used the variable in the network, and a blank meant we didn't. Okay. And uh, they used single layer, one, one <coughs> hidden layer in the network. And <coughs> what they had to do was try all the possible combinations. Okay, and look at these variables. It's like, okay, PT of lepton, PT of jet, that's cool. Um, here's a sum of the PTs, right? Just adding up other variables. Or here's a product of two rapidities, right? Some of these variables are just trivial, non-linear transformation of other variables. They did this because they had the experience that you needed sometimes to add a little bit of physics pre-processing. You can't just throw the data in your network and say, and assume it's going to figure it out. You needed to add your physics insight and say, I think there's a good variable in this corner, so I'm going to do a little bit of additional pre-processing before I give it to you, because the network was incapable of it. And what that meant was they had to say, I'm going to try and network with all of these things. Then I'm going to try and network with, without this variable. Then I'm going to try and network without this variable. And then they tried all of these possibilities. Okay? They tried to try a huge number of different kinds of networks with different inputs. Um, this contained all of the information, but if you give too much information to this network, it gets confused. It's not powerful enough to sort through the information. And so they found that the optimal network was one that used these seven variables out of 20. And then every time the Monte Carlo was updated, you had to redo this painstaking search through input space, right? So, and there was a whole field of inquiry that was starting to develop called feature selection. How do you choose what information to give your network? Because they're well known to have these limits. They cannot learn nonlinear functions. So that was the state of the art. Then people in computer science started to work on things called deep networks. So what do you mean by deep? You literally just mean more than one in layer. This is the depth of your network. So a deep network just means one that has multiple hidden layers. Okay? And there were new tools that developed that made it easier to train these. And, and they were being solved, they were being applied on really important problems, right? <laughs> problems like, is this a picture of Sylvester Stallone? Okay? Now this is not an easy problem, right? It's a hard problem. And in computer science, they're always looking for hard problems to solve. Hard problems to solve with vast amounts of data. And that's why you have entire PhD theses written on projects like, is there a cat in this internet video? Right? <laughs> Not an easy program to write. I couldn't write that program, right? It's, you have a you know, 30 by 30 image, maybe, uh, times time. It's a difficult thing to do. It doesn't mean it's important or interesting, but it's a huge amount of data on the internet about the videos labeled having a cat or not having a cat. So it's a well-structured problem. Um, and this is a project at, uh, at Facebook called Deep Face, right? Which it tries to figure out who this is a picture of. And it's very important to them so they can tag that picture of your kid and say, oh, look, this is Bob's cousin, but uh, we already know it. Right? It makes it easier for you. And the number of, like, computer science PhDs, the amount of funding dedicated to this problem dwarfs part of the physics, right? So this is why we need to surf on the backs of this amazing industry with the developing these huge tools. So, um, Sometime in 2012, I went over to the computer science department and I described sort of the state of the art of particle physics and, and machine learning and, and colliders. And I said, look, our neural networks are kind of dumb. Right? We know they're pretty useful, but we tried throwing uh, raw data at them and they just, they're just not very good at it. And they said, oh, well, we have much better tools. Uh, let's try applying. So we did. So I set up a sort of toy problem that I thought captured the, the, the limitations of neural networks as we need. And uh, the details of theory don't matter, but you know this one had a heavy Higgs to a charged Higgs to a, a standard to the, the Higgs we know and love, and radiating Ws. The major background would be TT bar K, which gives you also two Ws and two Bs. And the question I wanted to answer was, um, can deep networks automatically discover how to separate these two things? Just give them low-level <coughs> information. So what do we mean by low-level information? Well, at that time, I thought the best-case scenario would be I could just give it 
four vectors, right? I said, well, I have my jet, my left arm momenta, so that's three pieces of information for uh, five different objects. Pass it to missing ET, also tell it which jets have beta. <clears throat> if you look at these distributions, this is left on PT and jet 1, 2, 3, 4 PT, the signal is in red. You can't see much discrimination, right? There's not a whole lot of discrimination. Now, this is a 21 dimensional space. Each of these is a one dimensional projection. So clearly, there can be discrimination in a higher dimensional space that you don't see in this projection. But that's the task of the network, right? Figure out in this, what, you, what I thought at the time was a very high dimensional space, how to separate these. Now, um, of course, if you're a physicist, you know how to, how to give clues to the network. You know that there's physics structure here, which is very helpful, right? There's all these resonances here. Like, the signal has resonances in MBB when the background doesn't. The signal has resonances in MWBB, and WWBB. The background has its own peaks, right, that you can use to discriminate. So it's full of resonances that you can grab if you can find them. Here distributions, we have just these seven what I call high-level variables. And you can see that these things do a better job, right, <clears throat> of separating the signal from the background. And critically, these high-level variables are only functions of the low-level information. There's no additional information added, just physics clues. All right, so how did it perform? Well, first what I did is I just used a standard um, single-layer neural network. I did TMDA, and I said, here's what we would typically do. So if you pass it the low-level information, this black curve, so in case I haven't explained, this is the signal efficiency, and this is the background projection, right? And so, um, all right, so what you want to do is be here. This is the best case scenario. And for a given um, neural network, you're going to get a distribution of background, distribution of signal, and then you can apply a threshold. And at any threshold, you can calculate the efficiency for your signal to pass and the rejection of your background. Then as you move that threshold, you get a, a, a series of these points which scan out a curve, right? So because you can optimize on the threshold, essentially the way to compare two different classifiers is by looking at these two curves and saying which one is inside the other one. Um, and if they're simple in that way, if they don't cross, then you can just compare the integral under them as a quantitative measure. Uh, and here's an example of, of what it, how much fun it is to collaborate with people in other fields because they have different words for the same thing. Mm -hmm. right? like in particle physics, we call it an input when you're giving something to a neural network. In computer science, they call it a feature. Okay, whatever arbitrary terms. Uh, in physics, when you're, um, you know, when you want to know what the area is under a curve, we call that an integral. Right? In uh, computer science, they call it the AUC, right? Area under a curve. Right? Like, like there is not already a word for that. Uh, whatever. You have to learn this language. Anyway, um, so you just do a simple neural network giving the low level information. No clues about the resonance, 21 dimensional. You get pretty good performance. But if you do the high level information, right, you get this performance in red, which beats the performance of the low level information. Now, I was very careful to make sure that this is a subset of this information. Right? This has less information, just differently presented than this one. And yet this one outperforms this one. What? Why is that? It's because this network has failed, right? It's failed to find these um, physics, um, it's fa failed to find these physics features that we know are in there, right? So that's okay. This is what I expected. I constructed this example in order to have my network fail and to demonstrate, to prove that there was something that was missing. So when I apply my physics intuition, I beat a dumb network. Okay? And I also tried BTs, support vector machines, etc. Then I sent the data over to my computer science fellows, and they got this performance. They said, all right, if you get a deep network, so remember our best performance over here was 0.78. Right? We can talk about this later. Okay, so their deep network, with just the low level information, got this curve here. Right? It's a black curve right here. Performance of 0.88, right? Wow, pretty impressive. Now, what happens when you give this deep <coughs> network only the high level information? It does worse. Right? Why does it do worse? Well, there's less information in there, right? There's less information in the high level one. Now, if you give the deep network both the low and the high, it doesn't improve over just the low level information. Why? Because it says, I already knew everything you just told me, right? It figured out what the physics clues were, it maximized, squeezed all the information out of it, and it could tell that this high level information was redundant. No, there's no information in the 
capitals. Okay. It's just saying <laughs> these two performances are the same, right? So we know that the deep network has figured out what the high level information is, right? And the high level information do not have all the all the information, right? They have a subset of the information. So if I boil down 21 dimensions in seven, in doing so, clearly I threw out some information. Right? I did not perfectly capture it. If I was a, more of a physics genius, perhaps I could have counted got all that information into seven variables, but clearly I didn't. Right? So I lost some information in doing that dimensional reduction. And this is just what I feared. I feared that everywhere in particle physics, where we're doing future selection, where we're doing all this pre-processing, these physics clues to make our networks uh, work, that we were throwing away information in that pre-processing just to make sure our networks could, could function. And here, finally, was a network that you could just throw the low-level information at, and not only would it do better than you imagined, Right? But it, we think it might have actually gotten all the information out. Uh, how do the computing times prefer? How do the computing times prefer? Great question. So a deep network, it takes longer to train, right? Um, because it's more complicated. Um, and so I think you know, my networks took you know, an hour. Uh, these networks took uh, about a day. Okay, so it definitely takes longer. However, um, if you are going to do a lot of feature selection, you're going to have to try lots of different shallow networks. So it's about the same amount of time to try 24 shallow networks for one deep network. Between like low and high, are they comparable? Yeah, these are comparable. And you know, I thought this low level problem was high dimensional, given 20 dimensional information. But, you know, these guys were solving cat videos. Cat videos are thousands of features, and so for them, this is still a trivial problem. So we tried several uh, depths. We started with two, and we just kept increasing the depth of the performance plateau. And we found for this problem, four layers were enough. Oh, so it's not. It doesn't seem to be No, no. These days, people are training networks with like 50 or 100 layers, and they're very, very deep. You know. Okay, so and here's a direct comparison, right? Here's the deep network with no physics clues, right? Just the, the low level information. And here's the best shallow network I found, where not only did I give it the low level information, plus I also gave it my physics clues and said, Psst, I think there's a good variable over here, right? And still it couldn't even match the performance of the deep network that didn't have any human input, right? So does that mean the singularity has arrived, right? Not quite, right? I think what we've done is we've identified an important example benchmark where traditional networks fail to discover all the discrimination power. And in the past, you needed human insight to help traditional networks. But these deep networks can succeed without that human insight. You no longer need to do the physics preprocessing, right? And they still outperform human-boosted traditional networks, which I think is great news, right? But it raises some questions, really interesting questions like, what is it doing, right? Why does it work so well? Uh, what's possible to learn, right? And how is it extracting this information? Uh, how, how's the performance of just uh, resonance speeds be Oh, a single variable? Not a single variable, but you had a bunch of resonances that you combine two or three of those together. How would you combine them? Um, you would feed them into a shallow neural network, for example, right? No, I mean, two dimensions is not too bad for you. Uh, you can still oh, build your distribution based on two dimensional meaning. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the results here, but they don't compare to... You know, they're somewhere down here. Because each of these variables really does have some unique information. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this. Uh, why is deep learning possible, right? Um, previously, people only used shallow reports. Why suddenly can we use deep networks, right? What has changed so that the problem, which used to seem, which used to, seem to be intractable, um, it used to be too difficult to do deep networks and we avoided them, we convinced ourselves we didn't need them. Why is it suddenly now possible? Well, the answers are, 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 are many-fold. First of all, we just have more computing, right? So we can generate the huge samples needed to define the type of problems in these higher dimensional spaces. And we have GPUs and CPUs and farms of these things that are just more powerful. So we can spend more time training, we just push harder on these things. That's the number one answer, is we have more time to push on these problems. We can generate larger data sets. But very importantly, 
There are all these regularization tricks to avoid overtraining. Now you build a very, very complicated model. You apply it to a very, very large data set. It's very easy to overlearn, right? And so there are all these tricks called regularization, which avoid overtraining. Things like, like a change in the training sample, as you mentioned, there's one called dropout, where you remove nodes uh, at random times and then put them back in later so that they don't learn too much. It's a whole, it's a massive field of, of research, uh, how to develop these regularization techniques. And there's a lot of art to it. Okay, there are tricks and tricks. I did this other test where I said, here's my data set. I gave it to the computer science grad student, and he produced the results we saw. And then I gave the same data set to a physics grad student who had spent some time learning Keras and TensorFlow and new kind of networks, right? And I said, do your best, okay? So same input, same tools, and the CS grad student vastly outperformed my physics student, who I thought was you know, pretty savvy when he came to machine learning. Why? Well, he could recognize when it was overturned, when it was overtraining, and try this trick, and I would turn this learning, this turn this learning parameter. There's a lot of art to how to construct your network, how to train it, how to see when it's failing, how to find your way through this space and, and find that goal when you come in. So there's a lot of expertise still in organic neural networks for how to train these things. Right? There's, I think, another revolution coming where these things become automatic. We have a hyper network which trains the other networks or optimizes these parameters like how big should your network be and how should you train it. That part we're still it, we're still in the in the region where we need humans in order human experience in order to guide it. So I strongly suggest that you learn how to do this yourself. And then I strongly suggest that you pass your problem to some expert at your university and see how well they do and then learn from them. What tricks did they use? Because right? there's a, a vast amount of experience um, that, that is Okay, so what's possible? Well, you know, we start with our raw data, really, really high dimensional, you know, 100 million-ish. We sparsify, we say, let's only look at the hits that are things that are hit in the calendar. You build those into reconstructed objects, electrons, jets, etc. You select the ones of interest to your analysis. This is the dimensionality of the data set. And then you boil it down to one dimension. Maybe it's your mass variable, maybe you use uh, something else. And so I think I've shown you that often when we go from here to here, we're losing information. And that we can do better by using machine learning to go from here to here. To take your selected objects and just pour them into a neural network. Great. But does that mean we can skip more steps, right? Can we pass the neural network just everything in the event and say we don't apply selection? Can we, can we skip the reconstruction say here's everything that detected that we, which we did up, right? Can we hook up the machine learning directly to the fire hose of Chromatlas and say, email me the paper? <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that uh, what's possible? Right. Or is this a better approach? Where we say, look, these are recognizable touchstones. Right? We want to use our physics understanding. We want to understand it. Uh, what would that paper even look like? And would anybody believe that paper? Right? Right? Probably not. Uh, more reasonable is to say, um, we want to understand these various pieces. Maybe we could just improve each step with machine learning, right? We could say, hey, machine learning, do a better job in reconstruction. And yeah, I can verify these tracks. I can calibrate it against known sources. I can understand it and make some sense to me, right? Each of these steps might be uh, able to be improved with machine learning rather than skipping over the entire thing all at once. Okay, so that's what's possible. The deep question is, what is it learning? How are we making improvements, right? So for the example I already showed you, <coughs> we did this study here. We said, Here's a variable we know is powerful, the mass of basically the W and the BB. Right? We know that's going to have signal background discrimination. So here's what the signal looks like, the peaks. Here's what the background looks like. Right? There's some kinematic sculpting here from turn-on effects, but it's basically broader. And then we asked, what is the deep network doing? Right? And what is the neural network doing? So here's the neural network with seven input variables. And if you say, say the neural network, what, what's the distribution of events in this variable that you accept for a background rejection of 90%, then it gives you this pink curve. And what this tells us is that this neural network, which we told this variable, or we gave it these distributions, it says, okay, I'm going to listen. I know that this is a signal-rich region, and this is more background-rich, and this is more background-rich. So you see the neural network is focusing on this variable we told it, in the signal-rich region that we, we told it about. Okay, cool. What about the deep network? Now remember, we did not tell the deep network about this variable. We just gave it the inputs needed to construct it. Well, what did it do? 
it figured it out. See, here's the blue curve. It discovered that this is a useful high signal uh, region of the space. Why does it outperform the neural network? Well, it's very similar here, but over here, you notice, it goes deeper into background regions than the other network, right? I don't know what exactly what it's doing here, but it's found some other dimension in this space to scrape out signals in these more difficult regions. Right? That's how it's outperformed this network. It's not that it's come, it's, it went into a room and wrote down this variable, but it's figured out this same section of space, and we can project it onto this variable and identify what it's done. Right? So essentially, it's learned, it's learned these things, but you know, it can't spit it out in time. So that's a sort of a simple problem. Then we took on a harder problem. We said, what about a higher dimensional problem, like jets? Okay? Um, we can look at jets, and we can say, a jet makes a splash on the inside of the calendar. You could think of that splash sort of like a picture, right? Um, here's, for example, a single jet uh, where these are calendar cells turned into pixels, and each um, pixel here represents the PT deposited in the jet by any particles uh, that hit that part of the jet. And this is an example jet from a quark or gluon, a single object. And here's an example jet where there are two constituents, right? It's like a W to QQ. Now, you can't really see much difference, but if you average over 10,000 examples, you see this is what a single constituent jet looks like. There's a deposition in the center and things spreading out. And this is what W jet jet looks like. Where we've done some uh, transformations so that we rotate it so that it's always uh, sort of in this plane. And you see there's a deposition of energy here and a second one here. And so we said, look, neural networks are great at studying images. Right? Half of those pictures of Sylvester Stallone. People have developed techniques for studying images. Can we treat this like an image and try to do some deep learning on it? Um, so we passed this to our uh, machine learning colleagues. You can read the paper here. Uh, there was a very similar study at just about the same time by some folks at Slack. I got very similar results. And uh, here's the performance. We, um, first we tried, uh, actually I think what you were asking about, how well does a single variable work? So jet mass, for example. And here it's signal efficiency and background rejection, this time on a log scale. So if you just use the jet mass, right, which tells you this is a heavy object, it's a light object, it's pretty powerful. You can get some significant rejection. If you add variables from the theory community that, that are designed to discriminate between these two things, you can have additional rejection of a you know, factor of five or so. And there's a bunch of these variables. I mean, there were six variables that we considered. So what, what else we did is we combined all of those variables into a shallow neural network, equivalently a shallow said, how well do you do if you combine all of the expert information, right? So these are high-level variables. So that's this blue line. <coughs> and then we said, screw the high-level information. What if theorists are wrong, right? What if they've missed an idea or something is, is wrong about their construction? Let's just pass it the jet image and say, and give it no, no other information. So this is what the deep network did with just the high-dimensional high data, okay, this red line. So there's a couple of things to see here. <coughs> One is, the red and the blue are very close to each other. Right? So first of all, cool, the deep network learned everything the QCD theorists have proposed. Right? Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing is the blue line is pretty close to the red line. That tells us the QCD theorists have done a pretty good job. They have explored this space. They have come up with all or almost all of the ideas we need to solve this problem. Right? So kudos to them. They really have understood uh, the QCD physics involved. Right? no huge thing that was missing. And that's really important. It's, this is a, a way to use deep networks to say, are we missing anything good? Can you go the other way and extract from the deep neural networks the variables that are important? That's what I'm going to talk about in just two slides. That's exactly how we're trying to do that. Are these based on simulated data? This is all simulated, yes. Uh, so then, it's the QCD people's ideas that went into the generators in the first place. So sure. Sure, yeah, absolutely. There's some circularity there, yeah. That's the vector projection logarithmic. So the way you said it, you know, you don't know that, so how much better is it? We'll get into uh, and all those details, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. These are all the great questions leading into exactly what we want to do. So what is this network doing, right? Um, what we've done is we said we've taken the, the low-level data, can't calculate the likelihood in this space, right? It's too high-dimensional. You might think, 
look, why don't you just uh, use the low-level gen images, right? right? Here's your likelihood function, Daniel, right? Probability of this one, probability of that one, right? This is too high dimensional. This is 30 by 30 to 900 dimensional space. I can't generate enough data to do this effectively. And in general, this problem is, is can be a little higher, higher dimensional. So we can't calculate these in a higher dimensional space. So typically, we do expert physics knowledge. We make high-level variables. We have, we have a, um, a lower dimensional, high-level variables um, in which we can calculate the, the likelihood ratio, but it doesn't always capture that information, right? So that's the problem. But I would say that we prefer to use high-level variables. Why? Well, it's easier to understand. I mean, you can look at the distribution of jet mass and say, I know what that means, right? Its modeling can be verified, right? You can say, look, this, is, um, this looks the way I expect. Here's the W. It makes sense to me. Um, uncertainties can be well defined. Right? Our theorists can say, here I came up with this variable, here's the weaknesses of it, it's sensitive to this, it's sensitive to that. Right? It makes some sense. Also, it's just more compact. Right? If you can boil all the information down into a subset and keep all the information, then you're better off. Right? Why um, calculate 900 variables when you can calculate seven? Right? In addition, this part, going from low level information to high level information, this is what I call physics. Right? So let's not obviate it. Let's not say, let's take physics out of the equation. We don't really care. We'll just analyze 100 million dimensional, 100 million dimensional data and, and say we've discovered something, but we don't know what it is. Right? In the end, we always need to translate back to our own brains. We are the physicists. We're doing this for ourselves. So let's not have the networks discover something and talk to themselves about it in a way that we'll never understand. Can you just double up here? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have time. So then the question is, the question you asked, right? What is it doing? What has it figured out? Um, has it, for example, um, come up with some new high-level variable, uh, N sub, you know, jettiness 2, right, that we just never thought of, that no theorists happen to think of? Um, is its decision similar to all of these things, or has it found a completely new way to do jet substructure, right? We want to open this black box and see if we can learn new variables. So the question is, could it actually reveal some physics? If it comes up with a new way to do this, we might learn something about QCD from this network. Right? So what does this mean? It means we want to understand the structure of its solution. Right? Has it rediscovered? Or maybe it's just taken the existing variables and optimized them for exactly this problem. These variables are sort of generic. Right? They should work on lots of jets. Maybe it's just like tweak them in situ to get all the little juice out of this problem. So what is it doing? So I think that what we should do is that strategy for neural networks is not just throw the, high, the low level data and get a machine learning approach and then say you're done. I have a network which solves my problem. I think you use that to say how much power is there in my data and then try to map that, try to find, figure out what is it doing and map this into new high level variables which capture that information which are then understandable. Okay. How do you do that? It's complicated because you, if you already know, right, you had this one example, if you already know what the clues are, then you can ask, is it doing something similar? What if you don't know? You have a new problem nobody solved before. Right? So in order to understand the neural network solution, you have to define the language in which you want to answer. Right? Um, imagine you meet a new alien species, right? you want to talk to them about science. Right? You need for them to somehow translate their ideas into our space. Right? Do they speak mathematics? Do we have similar physics? You have to find a common language. So we have found a new alien intelligence, right? called um, computers, and they've learned something, and we want them to translate it to us. But since we're in charge, we get to decide um, how they're going to tell us the answer. So what we, first we want to do is define a space of all possible ideas. Right? Say, OK, tell me where your solution lives in this space. All these ideas I can understand. And then, so it defines the problem, gives a context for the solution, and we can ask, does the solution live in this space? Right? If it lives in that space, cool. We're like, okay, so you're using this idea. If it doesn't live in that space, cool. That means it's an idea outside all this, the ideas we had that's still useful and powerful. That maybe we should go back and re-examine how we constructed this space and, and think about the assumptions that went into it. Right? So I like setting up problems where both answers lead to, to interesting conclusions and papers. So I asked uh, Jesse Thaler, I said, give me a, 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 a set of all possible jet substructure variables you can imagine. And so he said, well, try this. 
um, form these variables zi, which are the pt fractions, and then uh, this is the tau 2 space, you know, the product of zi is for two cells raised to some power times the angular distance raised to some power. So kappa and beta are parameters. The idea is for any kappa and beta, you should be able to describe um, any two-point function. And there's a tau 3, et cetera, um, that you elaborate on. And actually, uh, recently, he's extended this to another basis set, but it's, it's not critical. The idea is the same. OK, but then we have this problem. How do you compare between the neural network solution and our solution, right? How do you say, I have my space. Where in my space does the neural network solution live? This is not an easy problem. First thing we thought is, oh, let's just compare correlations, right? I have one function. I have this neural network function, and then I have some arbitrary human function. I'll just see if they're correlated. But that's not a good idea, because correlation is a linear process, right? And you can apply a trivial, nonlinear, one-to-one transformation to the network and get the same performance. So correlation is not, is not what we want, right? Um, and we don't actually care if it's exactly the same function. We care, is it using the same information? Um, and so I think about it this way. I think like, here's your input space, right? And uh, you know, these are where points are in your space. And for any given, um, for your function, for some efficiency, it maps um, surfaces in that space, like thresholds in that space. What I'm really interested in is if you have two functions, right? So this one has this, out you take this whole space, you get this output distribution, you get this whole space, you get the output distribution. Then you put a threshold on that function. Each of these thresholds map to a <coughs> surface. What we're really, really interested in is, are these two surfaces the same? Right? Do they have the same set of thresholds? Right? Do they make the same decisions? Right? These decision surfaces. Do they categorize things the same way? So then I thought, OK, well, let's think about a pair of points, a signal point and a background point. Okay? And I have two functions, f and g. Right? One is my neural network, the other is my human function. I'm interested in. Does, for these two points, does my neural network function call this one more signally or this one more signally? Right? I'm interested really just in this relative information. How do they order the points? The absolute value of the function doesn't really matter. It's just really about ordering the points. Do they make the same order? If they have the same ordering, right, then it doesn't really matter what the distribution are. That's just a nonlinear transformation. But essentially, it's an ordering of the points. So we just asked, are these two things the same? So then we have this construction where we we integrate over all the points that we have, essentially, and ask, you know, do they have the same ordering, fx minus fx prime times gx minus gx prime, and then we just pass that through a heavy side function. So this gives us a discriminant. We call it discriminant ordering. It, it, it tells us how to compare two functions. Right? And if two functions have a large value, that means they're ordering the points in the same way in that space. It means they're making the same decision. So the first thing we did is we said, OK, here's our high-level variables, all the n sub jds variables. Right? And this feeds into a classifier. Now we'll create a low-level sub-network. Okay? This gets the jet image. And we'll train this whole thing together. The idea is that this already has a bunch of information. This one should learn only the residual information, right? What's in that gap? What's the extra bits that this thing did not learn? And there's some other structures that you can put in here where we have adversarial components to ensure that this and this are, are as orthogonal as possible. And then what we did is we asked, we took this apart, and we just looked at this subnetwork. We're not really interested in this network. We're interested in this. We're saying, what has this learned? Right? Is there a new variable in there? Um, so we did a, a comparison between this function and this whole functional space. And here's what we got. So this is kappa at right, the exponent of the PTs. This is beta, the exponent of the angles. And at every point, we calculate this discriminant order. And this means they make exactly the same choice for every function, or for every point. And this means there's no relationship between the choices. Okay? And the maximum value we found is somewhere over here uh, of 0.3, which is not very impressive. Okay? So what this tells us is the network is doing something. And what it's doing does not map well to anything in Jesse Taylor's. Okay, so that means that what it's doing probably breaks one of his assumptions. Um, Tillman suggests probably Jesse's functions are all infrared safe and the network is doing something non infrared safe. That's possible. So earlier, we were talking about the precise question we're trying to ask. And 
So that, that, I'm not sure if I just missed this, but what exactly is the question we're asking these uh, deep neural networks? That seems like that's a really critical. You're saying, how are you separating these two classes? How are you separating single jet, single object jets, and W? What information are you using to separate these things? So we're interested. Is that just an artifact of the simulation? Is it some baloney? Is it the clouds or the tanks, right? Or is it something deep about the jets themselves? So I was hoping it would be a huge spike here to be like, oh, turns out uh, kappa of 3 and beta of 3.2 is a really powerful function nobody ever thought of before. And I could send that back to Jess and say, what does this function mean? And come up with some QCD explanation for why actually this is a great insight into QCD physics, right? Then we could have learned some physics from this network. And then we tried something else. We said, what if we, instead of trying to add on to the existing high-level variables, what if we try to assemble a bunch of that variables from this functional space um, in order to match the performance of just the low-level network? So we have the network that takes just the jet image, and it does really, really well. Can we construct something which does makes the same decisions, right? So how many of these function points do we need to add together in order to build up a network which does the same thing? Because if we could say, oh, there's three points in that space, which when you add them together give you exactly this, then we could tell it, we could say this is using a combination of three different uh, variables in order to combine them. And so we did this search. And with just a single variable in this space, you can get a pretty good performance and a comparison with the, the network of about 0.9, right? almost 0.9, which means a single point in this space is capturing most of what that network is doing. You add a second one and you improve it. You add another one, you improve it pretty well. And with three points in this space, you plateau. And you get a relationship between the jet image network, which is just low level, and the network which combines these three variables of 0.9, which means it's very similar. And the performance is 0.93 in the discrimination. This was your question. But the, the low-level network still does a little bit better. Right? There's still that gap here. Essentially, what we've done here is we've matched the, the combination of the six existing high-level variables in the literature with three um, from this space. So we boiled it down from six to three. That's cool. But we still can't yet bridge this gap. 0.93 to 0.95. What's in that gap we don't know? So I didn't follow what, what's different between this and what you did before. So what we did before was say, let's just try to learn the, the extra bit. Right? These are existing ideas. What sits on top of the existing ideas? Right? That's the residual. Here we said, can we assemble a bunch of points in this space into its own network to match what's being done by the low level? Not the residual one, just that this one solves the full problem. And we try to assemble a, point, a set of points in this space, essentially a set of, of functions, which can capture what this is doing. So we have it yet. Okay. But this, this is ongoing research. What's in that gap? We're trying to figure it out. So now uh, we, we think that what's in that gap has to be outside of this space. So now we're trying to break down the assumptions that went into building this space one by one until we figure out what's there. And what we might learn, for example, is Okay, what's in this gap is infrared. It's infrared unsafe. And that's very important to know. You want to know when you're applying your, your uh, network that what you're doing is infrared unsafe. Right? Or you might want to say, well, I don't want to do that. So I will approximate the solution using only infrared safe variables. And say, I'm willing to give up this small amount of performance because these, this variable here, this network here, is better than this And so I'm going to prefer that. But I think the lesson to take away here is train a neural network on low-level data, on high-dimensional problems, raw inputs, to get a sense for how powerful your data is. But don't use networks that, that, that are doing things you don't understand to your data. Okay? Always needs to be translated, in my opinion, back into the human space. The uncertainty. Well, there's a statistical uncertainty, which comes from having a limited Monte Carlo samples. It's very small because we have a huge data set. So it's less than 0.01. So those are significant differences. So if we're only talking about IR safe variables, so what's the best combination of those variables? Which power of those things? So it's these three points in this capital beta space. So that's the usual tau variables we used before? Or yes, so what do these correspond to, right? 
Um, these are not the same as the usual timers. But it turns out this, the solution is not very unique. Lots of different combinations of three points in this space can be similar to points. But the, the existing uh, ideas do live in this space. So you're saying, you know, try to understand what the network is doing, don't use it. But in this particular case, you get really comparable performance. If your best case for all the best knowledge you can come up with is like, say, area under curve of 0.8 versus 0.95 for that, would you still be saying don't use the neural network? Not if I can't answer what it's doing, right? What if what it's doing is some artifact of the simulation and I apply it to the data, right? Um, I would not be comfortable using that if I don't know what it's doing. Now, we have ways to verify that network is doing something which is well modeled. You know, we can apply the network in data to background control regions to verify that what it's doing is, is well modeled by our simulation. So we can become more comfortable. But uh, I always prefer to understand what it's doing. Question. If it turned out that I was wrong about the So um, I also wanted to tell you about adversarial networks, uh, but we're out of time. I'll post all these slides so you can uh, look at these um, on your time if you're interested. Um, uh, here's just, let me just mention one more thing, which is sometimes you're solving a problem, and the problem you can tr has, um, the problem is um, the kind where you have an answer for every individual event. But here's a pile of jets from Signal, here's a pile of jets from Dynamo. Other times you have a problem where you don't have an answer for an individual event, you only have an answer for a collection of events. For example, um, at CDF once we were working on this problem with the top work mass, and we wanted to make a top work mass measurement which had the minimum uncertainty. And so the question we were asking was, what event selection was going to give us a top work mass with the smallest uncertainty? Right? This is not a property of an individual event, but a property of an ensemble event. So how do you train a network where you don't know what the true answer is? I can't tell a network of this event you wanted to keep, that event you wanted to keep. It's property of selection of events. Do you include more background, knowing that you're then going to get more signal, but then your background could screw up your measurement? So this is a much more difficult problem uh, because we can't use back propagation. Right? We don't know what the true answer is. So what we did is we used genetic um, algorithms. And we used um, genetic algorithms essentially um, what you do there is you create a vast pool of networks, okay? random <coughs> networks with random weights, and you evaluate, how does this network do? If I did my whole top fork mass measurement using this network, or this network, or this network, what is the uncertainty? So you can assign a score. You keep the best ones, okay? and you breed them against each other. How do you breed networks against each other? You need some sort of way to write the genetic structure of the network. If you code the structure of the network in a gene, right? So you can combine them and add mutations, etc. Then you get a new population of children of just the ones that have performed really well. And then you do some repetition. And um, the cool thing about this project is that we also allowed in the, um, in, the, um, in the mutation a change of the network structure. Because we thought we also want to explore the possible space of all network structures, not just choose one in advance. So sometimes we randomly added a new or we added a new link. This was actually fascinating because what happens when you add a new node is you add a random weight. And so initially these new nodes don't perform very well with care. So when you add a mutation, what you have to do is take these new nodes, put them off on their own little island for a few generations, and let them evolve. Right? It's exactly analogous to biological evolution. Sometimes you get some like, little birds, and they're off on their own island, and they have some weird feature to them. They're protected from the big guys on the mainland. They develop some new cool technique. And then once they've you know, had a few thousand years to, to perfect it, then they can come back and compete with the, with the, um, the big birds on the mainland. So that was kind of, kind of fun to see. What we discovered was that the selection, so this is the signal fraction of various selection, and this is the relative uncertainty of top-fork mass. So the heuristic, we had an existing selection devised by physicists, 
And physicists like to make, make the measurement of top work mass in a fairly pure sample. Uh, you like to see a peak there. So you suppress the background. And uh, so their selection of these nine was, had a signal fracture of about 0.7 and whatever uncertainty it used to have. The network discovered that this, there were some kinds of background which didn't make mess up your mass measurement, measurement at all. Essentially, were like just a rising flat background. And other backgrounds which totally screwed up your background, your measurement. And so what it did was it found a selection with much lower purity, uh, 0.3, but let in the kind of background that didn't affect the measurement, and also let in a lot more signal. So the amount of signal here is greater than the amount of signal here. The amount of background is also blown up. So we were able to improve the performance of the measurement um, significantly by letting in more background. All right, so I don't have time for school check machines either. Uh, here's a nice example comparing various things. So I'd say these are very powerful tools, deep networks. They're now available to us because we have more powerful computers and better ideas for how to do the training. We have lots of tasks in particle physics where we have these traditional heuristics, right? The problem is too hard, so we simplify it. We wrote a tracking algorithm. It does a pretty good job of taking hits and turning them into trajectories. Is it optimal? Certainly not. Right? There's definitely information being lost there. We should re-examine these things. We should say, can a deep network do better? And if so, we should take that information from the deep network and pour it back into human knowledge. All right. 